Thank you for here. Um, hello, well, it's very nice to be here. And Dr. Mean has done a very powerful, comprehensive survey of the whole book. I want to therefore focus just on one part, which is the issue of perceptions. Now, as he said, people act because of the way they see a situation, which may not be the same as the way it is. And so what we tried to do was through a series of perception surveys, ask the question, are the perceptions of inequalities the same as actual inequalities? And this issue was analyzed for five countries by Arnim Langer and Satori Mikami. So I'm drawing very heavily on their chapter. Now, why is this important? I mean, it's important first because horizontal inequalities are beginning to be acknowledged as an important cause of conflict and they're getting into the policy dialogue and indeed into some actual policies uh, across the world. For example, there are a lot of affirmative action programs, there are regional programs, uh, political systems are designed to take them into account. So there are quite a lot of policies which are going on, um, <coughs> partly for conflict prevention reason, reasons and partly for sheer justice in order to that groups should have justice. But in terms of conflict pre prevention, it's possible they would not be effective if they don't affect people's perceptions. If, in fact, you correct things, but people th still think it's unfair, you may be left with the same situation as before. So it's an important issue. Now, let me just say uh, a little bit about the uh, surveys. The, the ones that are being analysed in this chapter, they're not the whole number that Dr. Mine referred to, but... Um, just uh, five, Ghana, Nigeria, Kenya, Uganda, Zimbabwe. And they're not representative samples. They are representative of the particular area chosen, but they're not nationally representative. They're mainly um, urban. And some of them have several cities and some just have one city. Now, before saying anything about the results, uh, it's interesting to consider why one might expect perceptions to differ from actuality. Um, one is that personal, the personal situation derives the perceptions. I mean, if you are in a particular situation, you can see that you're poor. You don't necessarily know what's happening to everyone else in the community. And if you're poor, you may say, yes, I'm, our group is deprived. Now, of course, if you have a sample of the entire group, that should all wash out and uh, so that you've got the richer people who may not feel so deprived. But it's certainly the case that people don't have necessarily an accurate perception of what's happening to their group. And one reason they don't is because, particularly in conflict situations, perceptions are manipulated by the media and by elites. I mean, in this country, the perception of how many immigrants there are is vastly exaggerated by the... Um, by the media, for example. And there are many other examples of people having a totally inaccurate view of things because of the way that it's manipulated by the media. In conflict situations, leaders uh, use this uh, inequalities to drive the conflict and then they are likely to exaggerate it. So you might find it's very different from reality. And of course, this is all the more likely if there is an absence of objective data which there usually is, because very few um, governments actually collect data along lines of horizontal inequalities, that is, along ethnic lines, uh, racial lines, and so on. They may collect them for individuals, but it's quite unusual for them to collect them <coughs> for, in, for groups. And if they do collect them, to publicise them, because they feel that it's provocative. They don't want a group to know that it's much poorer than another. Even more, they don't want the group to know that the elite group is much richer than everybody else. So this information may be suppressed. Um, then, of course, people have misleading comparisons. They may well think about other groups, but they think about other groups in the context of where they live. So, for example, in um, as far as education is concerned, northern Ghanaians don't see huge group inequalities in their situation, although there are. And the reason is that they're living in the north of Ghana and they don't see what all the, all the other groups who are living in the south are getting much better education. But how do they know that? They don't know it. They only see the more visible inequalities. 
So they see that if you go for a job, you're less likely to get it, and they see particularly a government job, and they see who's running the country, but they don't see what the inequalities in education. And then finally, there is the point which uh, has been referred to already, cross-dimensional contamination. In other words, you may see an inequality in one dimension, and you assume that that is going to apply to the others. And in particular, as we'll see, um, if you see there's a big political inequality, you may assume, oh, your party's not in power, therefore we don't have any economic resources, even if that's not true. So let me go on to some actuals. First of all, this um, tells you the actual economic <coughs> horizontal inequalities in these countries, which you can see. I mean, <coughs> it's difficult to say what's large and what's not large because the methodology is going to determine what size these the figures are. But you can see the ranking, and they're all substantial. I mean, that in, in many cases, that the highest to the lowest is twice as much, um, and we're talking about large numbers of people. The second column the first column just looks at two groups, the best and the worst. The second column looks at all the groups for which we had data in the country and looks at the variance among them, so it takes into account all the groups. Interestingly, you get the same ranking for both of them, so it doesn't make much difference. But we could discuss all day methodology, and I won't. I'm just saying there are significant horizontal inequalities in these countries. Now, coming to perception measures, the questionnaire said, Think about the condition of your ethnic group. Are their economic conditions worse, the same as, or better than other groups in the country? And it then asked them to answer on a scale of one to five, with uh, one being much better and five being much worse. And in fact, we are just using the much better and the much worse, because once you get sort of in the intermediate ones, you don't get very sort of sharp results. So who's, who thought they were much better, who thought they were much worse? Now we see from this what were the perceptions of socioeconomic horizontal inequalities. And the first column shows you the perception of being most deprived. The Igbo thought they were most deprived in Nigeria. Were they? The second column tells you what actually was the situation. No, they were the second best group out of four. The, in Ghana, the U A Awe thought they were um, the most deprived, and they were pretty deprived. They were the fourth out of five. In Zimbabwe, then Debe Bailey thought they were the most uh, deprived, and they were actually the, be the top group. Um, in, Ke in Kenya, the Somali thought they were very deprived. They were very deprived, and so in Uganda, they were. Now you move to the third column, which shows you which groups thought they were the most privileged. And you found the Yoruba were the most privileged, and they thought they were the most privileged. But the Moli Dankwani thought they were pretty uh, they were the most privileged, and, in, and they come out uh, second out of five. The Shona thought they were the most privileged, but they're not, and so on. So what we're finding is that there are big differences between what people think and what is actually the situation. And so we wanted to find out why. Well, first what we did was to ask the same question, but on political <coughs> horizontal inequalities. Think about the position of your ethnic group. Do they have less, the same, or more influence than other groups in the country, again on a scale of one to five? Now this time we found that they were pretty accurate, all the answers. In Nigeria, the Igbo thought they were politically deprived, and basically they were. The Yoruba and the House of Fulani thought they were empowered, and basically they were. In Ghana, the ones who thought they were deprived were deprived, and the, those who thought they were privileged were privileged. And in fact, going down, we found that people really had a very accurate perception of which, power, which political group was in power and which were not. So what we are finding is that the, they're not accurate about the economic situation, but they are accurate about the political situation. So how can we explain the socioeconomic misperceptions? Well, regression analysis did confirm that a person's own basic needs position influenced their perceptions, so that was one point. But the most important point was the clear correspondence between what you perceive about your socioeconomic position and what your actual and perceived political position is. And you can see that here. The ones who thought they were economically deprived, all of them were politically deprived. 
practice reflected the reality and their perception of that reality about politics. And then we find the same thing about privilege, so that the political empowerment or deprivation <coughs> seems to be driving perceptions on the economic side. So what are the implications of these findings? Well, if correct, it would seem to give precedence to political horizontal inequalities over economic ones. Um, in other words, if we're worried about preventing conflict, we should do something about political inequalities, and maybe we can leave economic ones alone. Well, that doesn't entirely accord with the other evidence on horizontal inequalities and conflict. The general evidence is that socioeconomic horizontal inequalities are associated with an increased risk of conflict. But so is political, and so is the combination. But it doesn't say that economics has nothing to do with it. So this is somewhat in contradiction with the view that people only perceive the politics. So maybe perceived inequalities are not actually conflict-producing unless they are also actual inequalities. This is a question mark because the inaccurate perceptions w would make it seem that maybe economics doesn't have much to do with conflict, and yet when we look at the uh, m evidence across countries, it does, there does <coughs> seem to be a connection. What are the policy implications of these findings? First, clearly it's critical to eliminate the political horizontal inequalities, and m many of the ways you can do this are described and analysed in the book, particularly the the idea of sharing power at the centre, of dispersing power from federal with federalism and decentralisation. And the important point to note is that most good governance rules, which is what, um, on the whole, countries are told sh they should do for politics, do not take these very important lessons into account. They talk about majoritarian democracy. Uh, decentralisation is now acknowledged and, and is advocated. But shared power at the centre is not. And in fact, you have majoritarian power. And just today we can see in Thailand and, and I think in Ukraine that if you have majoritarian democracy, you can also have very serious conflict where the minority is not satisfied with the solution. And so it can be a conflict-producing situation. Turning to socioeconomic policy implications, do the findings mean we can ignore socioeconomic? Um, no, we argue not, because the evidence suggests they do contribute to conflict. And in any case, of course, such inequalities are unjust. So I even if there was no relationship with, uh, with um, conflict, one would still want to do something about socioeconomic inequalities. And the book explores some of the policy implications of this. Um, it also, there's also implications about getting accurate perceptions across to people so that they do know what is happening and they don't have misconceptions entirely led by um, politics. Uh, so that would be another policy implication of the book. Thank you.